Hi, I'm Jason, and I have the honor of sharing this fourth piece of Advent. We focused on hope, we focused on faith, we focused on joy, and I want to talk a little bit about peace. And I hope that these four questions that I'm going to end with are helpful for you in your spiritual formation group or as you watch this individually for self-reflection or if you watch it just with a handful of friends that you just want to process things with. And I want to focus on one short passage in the book of John chapter 20. And so it's John 20 verses 19 through 23. And the context is Jesus had already resurrected, but the disciples had locked themselves in a room and they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They did not yet know Jesus had resurrected. They had maybe heard, but had not seen. And there was fear, fear for their lives, fear of rejection. And I'm sure so many other nuanced fears. Starting, starting with verse 19 of John chapter 20, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So this emphasis on peace as we close out the Advent season and this expectation or, or at least a remembrance of the expectation of the birth of the Messiah and also in a way the expectation of the return of Messiah, how can we identify with this moment? So they're locked away, they're afraid of the Jewish leaders. Why? Because, well, the Jewish leaders were responsible for the death of Jesus, and so in their minds, who's to say that the Jewish leaders wouldn't then come for the followers of Jesus as well for their lives? And I thought in the midst of COVID and, you know, a long window of time of quarantine and even still trying to stay safe and not really being around people as much. I thought that this was an appropriate passage to think of locking ourselves in because of fear. It's understandable. And what we see here is I love, I love how the Gospels include these quirky little moments. It goes out of its way to remind us that the doors were locked. And so for Jesus to just appear and say, peace be with you. There's so much there about how in the world that's possible. Was he really skilled at picking locks and could get in? Or was there something else going on there in the, in the resurrected form of Messiah? And so he says, peace be with you. And so this word peace, shalom, it, it can mean wholeness when things are not broken, when things are made right. And of course, peace. So he says, peace be with you. What, what might that have felt like for them? If you were there, sitting there, and Jesus appears through a locked door and says, shalom. What occurs to you? What do you think? What do you say? How do you respond to that? After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So he showed them the hands and sighed, and then they were overjoyed. Maybe they didn't know it was him. You know, he, he came into a locked room and said, Shalom. So you can imagine if they're afraid, maybe when they saw a person that they maybe didn't recognize yet, there's some other gospel accounts that maybe can harmonize with that feeling that they saw the resurrected Christ, didn't yet know it was him. So they're afraid of people coming in, they lock the door, and all of a sudden there's a person saying, Shalom. They might have been alarmed. Uh, how did you get in here? <laughs> uh, thank you for extending peace. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Jesus extended peace in that moment. Uh, I come in peace. I'm, I'm not here to fight. And then he showed them uh, his sides. And I think that can tell us something very, very important on a very, very deep level that maybe one of the ways that fear is overcome is by the wounds of Christ. The wounds of Christ can overcome fear. Uh, he overcame the, the ultimate thing, right? Death. And then he extends this example, this posture, this proof that he has overcome this. And so they're very happy, as we can imagine. And then verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This, I think all throughout scripture, 
we should realize that if something is said a second time, it's meant to be very deliberate. I don't think he said it because they didn't quite hear him the first time. And maybe one of the things we can take away from this second saying is that maybe the first time he said it, they didn't know who he was. And I wonder how many times we have met Jesus and Jesus extended peace to us and we didn't know it was him. And then the wounds are demonstrated and showed to us. And then after realizing that it is Messiah right in front of us in our midst, Shalom is extended a second time because there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference maybe if you feel the extension of Shalom given to you, if you maybe think about it as coming from Christ, reminded that it comes from Christ, it maybe shapes it differently in our minds, right? So he says it a second time, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Maybe they didn't quite understand that part quite yet. And I really want to focus for a moment on this next verse. And with that, so with that meaning the second time he said shalom, he breathed on them. And where maybe is another time in scripture where there is a breathing on as a blessing? Yeah, very beginning of our story. When God created humanity in the image of God took the dirt, the clay, and formed it, and then breathed in. And that's what, that's what the, the ne- this nefesh uh, in, in the original maybe of breath is, um, or life force being given here, is that we are given the very life from God. We are made in the image of God, and then God breathes life into us. And so there's kind of a context. And so maybe that's why Jesus breathed on them. Uh, the, the word, or one of the words for, for spirit and breath in the Hebrew speaks to this it kind of um it brings up the connection between the word breath and the word wind and the word spirit and so uh breathing on breathing in might have evoked that thought in them it it might have been strange for them right how close was that how close was the breath was it was it one breath to all as a symbol or was it individually breathing on them how might they have felt in that but then it's very much connected with, and you see evidence here, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so this word ruach, uh, breath or wind, also meaning spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. Evoking back this image of being formed, being made new, being made alive, being breathed into by God to animate us, to make us be who we are, to have our life force, God's Spirit making us who we are in Him. We live and move and have our very being, right? And so uh, a breath, this should be considered in a way a bit of a, a new life moment for them, being born again, so to speak. So they were afraid, right? They started in this, in this passage, they started afraid because maybe they didn't yet know Jesus had overcome sin and death and He extends peace to them. Jesus had already overcome sin and death, but maybe they didn't know it. He extends peace, then demonstrates the wounds, then they're happy, then extending peace again, and then maybe instead of saying peace the third time, because I think there's a lot of theme of three, right? The third one maybe isn't him saying peace a third time, but breathing on them and saying to receive the Holy Spirit. So I think it's safe to say that there's a connection between being breathed on and experiencing shalom. And so many times we try to experience peace by changing our circumstances or fixing something or trying to figure out what the problem is. And I wonder how many times we we, we try to go out somewhere else to try to fix that when in fact maybe God wants to enter into our closed off space to extend that to us, maybe. And so as we finish up this Advent season in remembrance of the expectation of the coming of Messiah, the birth of Messiah, and then in the midst of where we are now as people who are still in eager expectation, waiting for the return of Messiah, waiting for this 
peace on earth, waiting for this thing that began to be completed, this thing that began to kind of bring the full version of it that we have uh, hope in our hearts for. Maybe God wants to enter into our locked spaces and breathe on us, extend peace to us, demonstrating that his wounds overcome the world. And so four questions for discussion, although I guess I've said probably 10 or 20 questions so far, but four specific questions that I'd like to suggest to discuss in your spiritual formation groups, or again, just for self-reflection, or if you watch this with someone in home, at your home, or a friend that you watch separately and you want to just have a conversation with. Question number one, how do you lock people out because of fear of rejection? So this is a pretty vulnerable question, right? But if you're willing to have a discussion with someone, and if you're not ready for that discussion with someone, at least try to own this feeling and process this in your own mind and heart. How do you lock out people because of fear of rejection? In what ways? Maybe you can think of some examples. Maybe even you can think of some specific people or groups or types of people that you feel afraid of being rejected by or worse. What mechanisms, what defense mechanisms have you created do you have that you lock yourself, lock the door for fear of the Jewish leaders, to lock the door so that the very one or ones you're afraid of cannot enter in? How do you do that? The second question is maybe a more basic, simple question, at least at first glance, is what does the word peace mean to you? When you hear the word peace, what does that mean? Does it mean lack of war or does it mean something else? Is peace something that is for primarily in your mind for a group of people or for the whole world or is peace something more so in you that you experience? If it's both, how is it both? So what does this word peace mean to you? And the third question is, can you think of a time when God showed you the wounds of Christ? Can you think of a time? Now, obviously, I'm not talking about literally right now where you saw the literal wounds of Jesus, but can you think of a time when you felt like this, the, the wounds, either the suffering or the overcoming of sin and death that were demonstrated as proof that Christ has overcome the world. As God showed you something like that, or another way of asking it is, have you experienced the feeling of the wounds of Christ? Can you think of a time when God showed you the wounds of Christ? And the fourth and final question is, maybe would you be willing to Share. Would you be willing to share a time when Christ breathed on you and said, receive the Holy Spirit? And again, these are, these are specific questions to have discussion with, but they're a bit abstract because I have never seen the face of Christ and felt the actual literal breath and hear, heard those words. But there are moments where I have felt the presence of God so closely and intimately that I felt breathed on and at least symbolically felt that spoken word over me of receive the Holy Spirit. When have you felt breathed on? When have you felt like this shalom was extended to you, overcoming fear, that you knew that the very presence of God was not only near you or loves you, but that you receive, that is with you, in you, a part of you, a part of your very identity now? And so, my sisters and my brothers, in the midst of or at the end of Advent, as we have waited with eager expectation and remembered that feeling of waiting, and then even now as we experience a very deep feeling of an expectation of peace in the world, and maybe for many of us and ourselves, may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's face shine upon you.
and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas.